I'm Spencer King here at the Euro PCR 2018 and I'm having the pleasure today to visit with uh, Elmer Omerovich who is from Sweden and he's going to talk to us about the SCAR registry. As we all know, this is a fantastic uh, registry. It's been going since 1989 looking at complete data from patients undergoing PCI in Sweden, giving an opportunity to really learn some things about not only the acute outcomes of patients, but the longitudinal follow-up with individual patient identifiers. And we're excited about this registry. And you've got some interesting data that is unique, I think, in stable ischemic heart disease. Tell us what you found. So our study <coughs> concentrated on the patient with stable angina pectoris. And we asked ourselves, what is the importance of using parameters of physiological assessment of lesion severity, in this case, FFR, FFR and I EFR. IFR. IFR. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we had a large cohorts that were prospectively follow up since 2005 to 2016. So okay, it's to give an impression of what the size, so this is everybody having PCI in Sweden. Right. So in the stable, let's take the acute infarcts yep. and un acute syndromes out. Stable ischemic heart disease, during that time frame, how many patients? Uh, there was approximately uh, 50,000 patients, but then we excluded a certain patient that didn't underwent um, PCI, uh, and also those that didn't have uh, FFR and IFR significant lesions. So when we excluded them, we ended in two groups, approximately 22,000 uh, having undergone PCI based on NGO in uh, information only, yeah. and approximately 3,500 where information from FFR and EFR has been squared into the decision making. Okay, 22,000, a normal angiogram, yeah. follow, decision process based on, on that, plus the clinical information, and, and the other group. Correct. Uh, 3,000 that, that, that had uh, these physiologic measures. Immediately, I'm, I'm curious why these patients had IFR and FFR. Was it just a random or? What was the reason? I think it's a combination of randomness on one, on one side, uh, because in Sweden different centers adopt technology differently fast. That's one thing. It's, that's the, a part of the randomness. But then also, as I showed in my presentation, there was an increase from approximately 15% back in 2005 to almost 40% uh, in 2016. So the is yes. ramping up. On ramping average, up. it went up by 14% uh, for each year of, and that's a combination of increasing evidence and adaptation of the, of the methodology by operators and by hospitals. Okay, and also I, was, I would assume that uh, measuring these physiologic parameters is more likely if you are on the borderline of uh, lesion. If you're 95 percent almost you probably don't do it if you're non-significant lesion you probably don't do it yeah. what, what, give us a, a feel for how people yes i, I think that's that's uh, w uh i one could interpret that important question that you are asking me if there is in our analysis that showed some important data perhaps we will discuss that later it are these populations um substantially different from each other or do we have um, uh, an impact of residual confounding when we arrive in our risk estimates and that will possibly be a source of confounder if if those patients that we used physiological assessment were more of the in the gray zone or the borderline so so we, we i'm a great believer in registries i think we we learn a great deal from registries so i don't want to attack a registry yeah. so much but I do want to get down to what what you found because you had a cohort of patients where you use physiologic information a cohort of patients which you did not yes what did you learn we learned that uh, using a cohort prospective cohort in which we used 
information from FFR, IFR. They had a hazard ratio that was 0.83, significantly lower compared to the patient in which we performed. Hazard ratio for what? Hazard ratio for total mortality, correct. So, so we're jumping right to the hard endpoint uh, of uh, death. That, uh, up, to, up to 10 years and more uh, from the index PCI. And what I forgot to tell, and I didn't have time during the presentation, if we look at the kaplan meier curve, so this association between lower risk actually start to separate first after one year, uh, which is an interesting observation that we need to look into, perhaps the possible pathophysiological mechanisms to learn more why perhaps physiological indices help us to make a, a, a better decision. So we have a lot of information about using physiology, and we've seen that it improves certain things. We put in less stents, like uh, FAME studies. We, we, so we've seen a, a, an improvement in some outcomes, including uh, now myocardial infarction. Impro the improvement in mortality, overall mortality, has never been shown, as far as I know, in a randomized uh, trial of stable ischemic heart disease. But your data shows that. Now, uh, it's going to be, everyone's going to be very interested. Okay, uh, we'd love to believe that. Right. Uh, tell me yourself, what, what concerns do you have uh, about it and, uh, on the one hand, and why do you think that, that, that this is a, a real uh, valuable data that can drive practice in the future and maybe even changes from not being able to, to being able to only not only relieve angina, not only to prevent uh, repeat intervention, not only to relieve infarct, but maybe we could tell patients in the future yeah. uh, this might be life saving. Because I can tell you, we as physicians always see patients where we know, in our mind, that we are saving that, that their life is being improved. Right. We, we know that for the individual patient. Yeah. When we get down to studies, you know, it is much harder to show because we have this average of everything. Right. Your, your study must be tightly adjusted for a lot of variables. Tell us how you did that. So we, we did a, a primary analysis that was, which was a Cox proportional hazard regression. And we squared in with the propensity score uh, a certain patient characteristics that were different between these two groups. That would be a classical analysis of uh, risk estimation with the statistical methods. And then we did a number of sensitivity analysis, and I, I got that question, I think, from you during the presentation. And uh, when it comes to the residual confounding that everyone is, of course, re rightfully asking uh, if our risk estimates are uh, realistic. So we did a number of sensitivity analysis, of which the most important one is the analysis that we can do with so-called treatment preference instrumental variables. And in our case, it was a year, calendar year, because we have increasing number of procedures year by year. So by applying this methodology, according to the statistical professionals, this is as close as you can get to the act of randomization. It is my understanding also as a, as a clinician. So when, when, when we do that, uh, then we end up in a similar risk estimate. So association between using this information in the decision making and the outcome in this case, uh, both total dead and as we also showed, uh, stent thrombosis and resinosis was substantially yeah, decreased. That's what I was going to ask. So the mortality we've been concentrating on, yeah. but was it uh, a parallel, was it uh, similar to other adverse outcomes that you yeah, The interesting observe. thing he, here that we need to look into more closely is that this um, association between better outcome in terms of total mortality, it came after one year, but the association between risk of resinosis and thrombosis was the, the curve separated quite early after the index PCI. Okay. So that's something that we need to understand better mechanistically. So whenever you raise an issue like this that, <coughs> that challenges uh, common thought, okay, we've never shown improvement in survival, stable ischemic heart disease, everybody says this kind of thing, while we know on an individual basis we do, 
And now you, you, you've challenged it and you said, we're showing you that you may reduce mortality. What do we need to do to confirm your impression that you've got uh, we probably, story? Yeah, we probably need a, a, a proper, properly uh, designed and conducted large randomized clinical trials as we always do when we have a limited knowledge and we of course want to challenge the existing dogmas, uh, clinical or scientific. So we'll probably need to do that. In and the and absence of do, that... If we do yeah. that, what kind of patients could give us a chance for showing that? Should we be more selective than theme two, for instance? Yeah, well, I, I, I would interpret our data uh, because the advantage of the mm. SCAR is exactly what's limitation of the randomized clinical trials. It's the real life you, data. You involve everybody. Yeah, everybody, <coughs> kind of all comers. Yeah. And, and, but it can be so, and that's a hypothesis on my part, that the advantage of revascularization is higher in the high risk patients in real life than, than compared to those that were, were treated within the scope of the randomized clinical trials. Perhaps we need more inclusive and not selective uh, as we did, for example, if we compare the old uh, bypass, you know, cabbage trials and... Um, so there may be real clues here to how we design future randomized trials right. to get at this issue uh, w once and for all. Uh, I think this is incredibly valuable yeah. uh, information. It's very provocative. And again, congratulations on this SCAR registry, which has been so helpful to us over the years. Well, thank you for visiting. having me. Thank you.